Victoza mm-hmm. and eventually Ozempic. So what they found in the confirmatory trial was not only did it control blood sugar, mm-hmm. but it also uh, helped the patients lose weight. Really? This is like a burning question I've had for years and I just have never looked it up. And now I have you, <laughs> a human WebMD. <laughs> it, it actually changed the shape of my face. I have pictures of it. Really? I, I don't know if I could eat like a tomahawk steak raw like that, you know? And I'd be like, it feels fine. And then you'd go like, and I'd be like, ow, what the hell? And then I'd be like focused on that. And he'd be like, well, how's your knuckle feel? And I'd be like, I don't know. Welcome to Days at Night. We're having Chubby Emu on. Do you want to be referred to as Chubby Emu or do you want to be referred to as your actual name? Yeah, Bernard, Dr. Bernard, Chubby Emu. Dr. Bernard. Whichever one's good. I'm down with Dr. Bernard. I mean, you (laughs) earned the... PhD, thank you, might as thank well, you. you know, go, go <laughs> you by your official title. Um, would you tell the audience about like what you do a little bit? I'm sure a lot of your fans are here, but yeah, you know, definitely. just in case they don't know. So when I talk, do I, which camera do I look at? You can look at, right, all, any of the three, right? So he can look at this. Okay. That's probably most natural for you. Okay, cool. This one. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm Dr. Bernard. Uh, you might know me as Chubby Emu on YouTube. I've been on for nine years now, since 2015. And I'm a toxicologist by training. I did a, a residency and a fellowship. And you know me from the videos that I post online talking about cases that either I've seen in the past or my colleagues that I work with on the videos have seen in the past, or sometimes they're published in literature. Very nice. That's a solid intro. Okay, so one thing that we talked about before you came on was your involvement in Ozempic really early on before it was known as Ozempic even. Can you speak to that experience a little bit? Yeah, so it was interesting. Um, The precursor, if you will, to Ozempic was another medicine called Victoza, also known as Liraglutide. So that, mm. that's the uh, Where did the, the names come name. from? So uh, the Lyra part, I'm not sure, but Glutide is part of the way that the medicine works. Oh. So it's a GLP-1 uh, agonist, so glucagon-like peptide. So that's where the oh. glue part comes glue. from. Yeah. <laughs> and so like you'll see all the competitors of, of Ozempic, mm-hmm. they'll all have the glutide Ooh. part. And the, the tide part means that it's a protein. So oh. uh, it's, a, it's a peptide. That so it's a sense. chain of, of multiple proteins. And so what's interesting is in, in, our, in probably the last 20 years, mm-hmm. we've lived through multiple huge revolutions in diabetes treatments. Mm. So there's, uh, in, in context of diabetes, right? So it's a problem of sugar in the body. Mm-hmm. There's two main types. So you have type one diabetes mm-hmm. where the pancreas can't make insulin anymore. So what typically happens is when you eat, uh, you get uh, all the nutrients everywhere in your body and your body needs a way to say, hey, cells, we have nutrients, mm-hmm. you need to take, take them in. So the way that it signals that is through hormones. Got it. And uh, insulin is that hormone that comes from the pancreas to say, hey, there's a bunch of sugar in the blood now because mm. this person just ate, so let's absorb it. Right. Now, the problem is in type 1 diabetes, the pancreas just doesn't make insulin. In type 2 diabetes, the pancreas makes it, but the cells don't do anything with it. Right. So it just, it just sits there yeah. in your blood. Yeah. And so in both cases, you could either get too high of blood sugar or just it, 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 it can go down mm-hmm. real quick. So it's, it's always a problem of blood sugar control. And so uh, that's when they discovered insulin uh, mm-hmm. back in the early 1900s. Because of diabetic shock, like they were trying to work backwards or? So it was mostly because of type one diabetes oh. where these people, they wouldn't live for very long because they couldn't really eat mm-hmm. because their body wasn't releasing the insulin. So there wasn't, the sugar wasn't going down. And so they, they just, they didn't eat very much. They were malnourished. And finally, when they discovered that this hormone actually exists to lower the blood sugar, what they did was the original insulin from the early 1900s was from cows really? and from pigs. Really? And so they would ground up uh, either cow or pig pancreas and extract the insulin and then injected into these type one diabetics, and it was it was a game changer, wow, life saving. Now the problem with that is pork and beef insulin, they differ 
uh, just by a little bit right. uh, on, on the insulin protein. And so in humans, over time, what happens is you become allergic. Oh, it starts to reject it? Yes. Similar to like concerns with bovine valves and stuff, right? Right. Got yeah. it. And so patients in like the 50s and 60s used to swap. They're like, oh, well, I'm, I'm getting allergic reactions now to beef insulin. I'm going to move over switch to pork. It up. And then switch it over again. Wow. And so what's interesting is in 1980, there was a company that figured out, well, we know what the chain of in- human insulin is. Can we genetically engineer it? inject that gene into a bacteria and force the bacteria to make that exact protein. So is that like early DNA hacking or is it like different? Yeah. That's cool. Okay, so I was right. So it was was the birth of biotech. (laughs) Wow. And so it was a company uh, called Genentech that was the first one that did it in 1980. And once they figured out, oh, we can get bacteria Mm -hmm. to make human insulin, we didn't have to deal with pork or beef anymore. Wow. Get them out of here. We don't even need them anymore. Yeah. Okay, and so that was uh, that was two revolutions of diabetes treatments. Yeah. And so what happened was throughout the '80s, they figured out, you know what, we know this protein sequence, or the, the amino acids and everything. Is there a way where we could slow down how quickly that insulin gets absorbed in the body? And is there another way where we can make it really quick? And why that would be a benefit to patients is in the hospital. Let's just say somebody has type 2 diabetes and they have trouble controlling their blood sugar. They ate dinner Mm -hmm. and now their blood sugar is sky high Mm -hmm. and you want to control it. Well, we can give a slow acting insulin for the nighttime. And hopefully it's so slow that when they wake up to use the bathroom that they won't fall down because the blood sugar is too low. Right. So it is a very uh, slow acting insulin. And then there's one that's very fast acting because let's just say somebody's having a blood sugar emergency. So they need a real fast acting. Yeah. We need to lower it right now. Save their life. Yeah. Situation. Exactly. Yeah. And so they came up with both of those use cases. And that happened in probably around 2000. God, that's so cool. Yeah. And so regular human insulin is, uh, in some states, you can get it uh, over the counter. or mm-hmm. you, You'd have to ask for it. But you, you can get it for a relatively low price. It's usually like when we argue about the insulin prices, mm-hmm. it's, it's a lot of times, not, not all the time, but it's the fast and the slow acting ones. That makes sense. We have Eli Lilly in Indianapolis, yes. like the, the huge campus. So oh, yeah. like we hear people talk about insulin all the time. Yeah. That's interesting. And then Ozempic is obviously, is, is it a for slow or fast or is it both or so, its own thing? So it, it, it's its own thing. Okay. And so what happened was by 20, 2009, 2010, mm-hmm. uh, the company that had the patent on the fast acting insulin, I think it had already expired. Right. Because they last like about 25 years standard yeah. patents. Yeah. And so- they thought, well, we specialize in diabetes. Is there mm-hmm. something uh, additional that we could do? So in 2010, they got Victoza liraglutide approved. Mm-hmm. And it controlled blood sugar in a little bit different of a way. What happened uh, maybe about five years earlier, there was another kind of diabetes medicine that you take as a tablet. And oh. it helps control blood sugar. This, I think this I is remember seeing commercials for that. Yeah. So you don't have to use the needle. Like for people that are scared of the needle, they yes. can just... Yeah, yeah. It, it, they're called the gliptins. So Glyptin. uh, yeah, that, that's the generic name for them. So the God. first one was citagliptin. Citagliptin. That, I think, yeah, it came out in 2006. So they I were, love the names <laughs> for all of these. <laughs> they all have good names. And it was um, Genuvia is the brand name for it. Genuvia. Genuvia. And so what, what was interesting is that it stops the breakdown of certain hormones mm-hmm. that get the pancreas to release insulin. Got it. Now, how that's related to... Victoza Mm -hmm. and eventually Ozempic is that it stops the breakdown of what Victoza is. And so so we already now have two parts of this pathway that Mm -hmm. leads to blood sugar control. So in 2010, when they got uh, liraglutide approved, they found out in the confirmatory clinical trial. So so the way that the drugs get approved in the United States is you have to do the study. Yeah. And then when you do the study, you have to prove that it does something mm-hmm. and that it's safe. Mm-hmm. Those are the two big ones. And so they found out, yes, liraglutide does something and it's relatively safe. There was a, a, a warning that was slapped on it uh, right, at, right, right at the get-go. Right, because there can be some caveats, like may cause heart attack in some patients. And, you know, they always yes. have like lists at the end of yeah. infomercials. So like there's a certain <laughs> amount of risk allowed as long as it does a certain amount of good. Yeah, and the FDA requires that you have to say those in yeah. the direct-to-consumer ads, which 
you know. That's why they always say it's super fast. Yeah. May cause heart attack and stroke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it always gets kind of like an awkward situation. Yeah. So what they found in the confirmatory trial was not only did it control blood sugar, mm -hmm. but it also uh, helped the patients lose weight. Right. And so they noticed that, wait a second, like, w w w how is it doing this? And w what's interesting is the loraglutide came from a discovery in the saliva of the Gila monster. Really? Yes. In tell me about <laughs> that. <laughs> so it's a natural product, and uh, I don't exactly know how they came across it, mm -hmm. but it was, uh, there's a branch of medicine called pharmacognosy, okay. where oh. they try to find... Uh, medicines from natural products. So either extracts from animals right. or extracts from plants uh, or bacteria and all of that. So they found that this saliva of this Gila monster, mm -hmm. if you change the protein just a little bit, it kind of mimics a uh, digestive hormone that we have in our body. So why don't we try and, uh, you know, change it a little See bit and then inject it people. in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And so uh, around that time, um, the company was having some because uh, their patent just expired. Mm -hmm. So they needed a new co uh, new compound to yeah. you know try to save the company, yeah. if you will. And so this this was the one that kind of saved them. It became a billion dollar drug, I think within like a year or two. Unsurprising, because I mean, with diabetes, it's wouldn't it be mutually beneficial to be able to control your weight as well? Like you yeah. don't want to be too skinny, you don't want to be too overweight, you want to stay within a healthy range. Yes. Right. Yeah, and so what's interesting is, uh, fast forward a couple years, we're like 2014, 2015, mm -hmm. the... Uh, the landscape now, and Eli Lilly was part of this, was uh, that you can change some of the proteins mm -hmm. on this loraglutide mm -hmm. compound. And what happens then is that you only need to do it once a week, not once every day. Oh, wow. That actually is huge. That's yeah. a huge difference. Yes. Yeah. And so that was where they thought, well, wait a second. If you're only doing it once a week, you're more likely to stick to it. Yeah. Rather than you got to do it every day, then some people say, I, I don't want to stick a needle in me today. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm done with it. Right. Yeah. And so they found out, oh, well, it's the same principle as the insulin. We can change some of the proteins, make it a little bit slower. And then from there, or, or we could make it faster if we really wanted to. Mm -hmm. And then they use that same principle. And then again, they found out, oh, actually there's weight loss involved in here. So around that time, they were really trying to push all of that. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to be like, is there a way that we can have a weight loss compound that isn't psychoactive, yeah. directly psychoactive in how we normally treat obesity at this particular point? So that was where the, the beginnings of it was. The compound semaglutide uh, is a little bit different than liraglutide. It, it's different by like a couple proteins. Mm -hmm. And it, I believe it can act slower. So you can only, you don't, you don't need to give it every day. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so the way that from a dietary standpoint, the way that it functions from what I understand is it's an appetite suppressant, right? But it also just makes you, does it make your metabolism go up or how does it make people lose weight so quickly? So it is a hormone for the stomach. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that it does is that it does slow down how the, how quickly stuff moves through the stomach. God. So that's one. The other one is that it also then helps control blood sugar. And so by doing those two things at a minimum, there's probably a lot more going mm -hmm. on there, but just doing those two things will help with blood sugar control and with weight. Right. So if it's going slowly through your digestive system, you're going to feel full longer yes. as well. So you're not going to yeah. deal with like the hunger pains and all the negative aspects of dieting. So yes. do you think that's why it's boomed so much in the celebrity space? So, yeah, I think in the celebrity space, because the, the thing is, um, you know, a lot of times people will say, uh, oh, Big Pharma uh, wants to make as much money off mm -hmm. of, you know, the people not, uh, people just can't do the lifestyle adjustment or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, that's not, I, I'm not, you know, shilling for Big Pharma in this case, because <laughs> I, I don't work for that company anymore, right? Um, but what's interesting is that it's the diet and exercise are the mainstay. Yeah. The, the issue is that what we call adherence. So it's mm -hmm. like, well, you could diet for three months and then rebound again and then, you know, live your life before that three months again and then get back to where you, you were. originally were. Yeah. Right. And so that's where then it, it has a good efficacy. So it, it mm -hmm. does a lot if you can pull it off. But whether or not you stick with it is an issue. It's up to you. Right. right. So if your lifestyle doesn't change overall, no amount of exercising and dieting is, is going to help you if you stop doing that. Right. And sometimes yeah. people in the clinic will get 
I don't want to say jaded, but they just know from experience that some people would just not stick with it. Even you recommend uh, diet and exercise, they might just say, eh, you know, I, right. I, I won't stick with it. Yeah, or so, if they're a compulsive eater or something like that, there's right. other things going on that yeah. they feel like they're just probably not predisposed to be able to make these shifts so easily. And in some cases, the medicines will cause uh, temporary diabetes. Oh. Yeah, so some people might be taking like uh, steroids for uh, their immune system. So we call them glucocorticoids, not not the anabolic steroids. Right. Uh, you know. We will get into those yes. later, though. Yes. 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 And so the those steroids they will cause blood sugar to to jump up. Got it. And it it actually some of them are are very difficult medicines to take. Mm -hmm. So then you know we can add on some of the diabetes medicines mm -hmm. in certain cases. But it, it becomes a balance, right? So a lot of times people will say, oh well, the moment I go off of Wagovi or Ozempic. I just gain all the weight back. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people on TikTok saying that. Yeah. And then the comments, like, you know, they're, they're a mixed bag of people saying that, oh, it's because of the way you're living your life and other people being like, no, the same thing happened to me. So you think it is more of lifestyle? It depends, right? So it, it's not always lifestyle because that particular person's situation might be different. They might be taking, right. you know, certain medicines that are causing it. Uh, certain like antidepressants mm -hmm. will also th cause, cause weight gain. Yeah, yeah, and they'll cause you know metabolic changes in the body, mm -hmm. and then also just changes with how people will respond to things like food and drink. Mm -hmm. So all of that needs to be accounted for. And a lot of times the granularity gets yeah. lost in the There's comments. just a lot of variables. And yeah. there's also the genetic factor, which a lot of people, when it comes to like the fitness space, yes, there's it's sort of like almost like controversial, the yeah. role that genetics play in things, because half the times I see comment sections that are like, I'm so glad that this creator is admitting that a lot of their success is due to genetic factors. Then other people get demoralized by that where they're like, well, can we have some routines that just work for everybody no matter what, <laughs> right. you know? And it's like, what, is there a workaround for that? Do you think, or? Uh, I mean, th the thing is like, it really does need to be tailored to the person and yeah. their, their situation. Um, there's so many different factors going on. And like, when you, when you've seen enough patients and you've talked with enough people, mm -hmm. like no two people are the same. Yeah. And so to be able to tailor it to them uh, in a way that's palatable. I remember when I was in school, we had a lecture about diabetes. Yeah. And ar around that time, I was, you know, doing my powerlifting thing. Yeah, you're getting jacked. Yeah. <laughs> and the lecturer said this one thing that I just, I remember shaking my head at, but then I thought about it. I was like, I'm going to not think this way later in my life. I'm almost sure. You were like, it's going to come back around. I'm going to reassess. And she said like, when I work with patients, this is her words, like she's paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. She said, some patients have trouble being active. And it could even just be as simple as if they don't have weights at home, have them hold uh, soup cans in their hands and try to do like a shoulder press kind of movement just to get them moving. Yeah. It doesn't need to be, you know, hardcore bodybuilding, you know, yeah. uh, athletes. Super you know. strict, like regimented, right. classic it, workout It's schedule. just a thing of getting them moving. Mm -hmm. And so I remember that very clearly. And then when then I started going into practice, I remember I was like, oh, this is a reality. Yeah. Right. And even I even see it with my own family. Like my dad has type two diabetes mm -hmm. and just getting him moving around. It doesn't need to be, you know, running five miles every day in the morning. It, yeah. It's just getting him walking around, getting him moving and he's doing getting really up. well. Yeah. Just getting him on that. I feel like that's me. Like I struggle in a gym <laughs> environment, but like yeah. I need a because I have chronic pain because my whole spine is fused. So oh, I have like okay. a hard time moving around sometimes. I, I would rather I would rather lie down because I, I just don't feel comfortable when I'm moving. But the more I move, the better I feel moving is the thing. So got it's it. like, yeah. you, I got to move around. Yes. I don't always like doing it. <laughs> My boyfriend's <laughs> got to make me do it and I don't like doing it. But then I feel much better at the end of the day, you know? So yep. sometimes it is just a matter of like getting up, cooking food, walking around, yeah. doing stuff instead of just like waking up, getting your coffee, sitting in a chair, right? you know? Which I feel like a lot of people fall into that trap, especially as they get older. Yeah, and contextually, it's hard to switch because it's like I'm sitting at the computer and it's like, do I really want to get up? No, I just yeah. want to let me just focus on this, what I'm doing. And then like hours later, you still haven't gotten up. And yeah, you're, you're like, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, now the day is almost it's it's five o'clock. I might as well just might as well just lie down. Yeah. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> and then I have to be like, don't get up, go outside. Having pets makes it easier because I have to take them outside. Ah, okay. So then I'm like, I'm forced to go. Yes. Unless I want to like clean up dog pee in my <laughs> carpet, which I don't. So then I'm like, I got to get out of there. But um, with, with Ozempic, 
I've been seeing a lot of people on TikTok and I'm so interested to hear what you think about mm -hmm. this. Cause like I have like a suspicion, but I'm not like an expert. I've been seeing a lot of women specifically talking about how they've struggled with fertility over the last few years. And then within months of taking Ozempic, they've accidentally gotten pregnant. Um, do you think that that's correlation? Do you think it's causation? So it's interesting. Um, there could be an underlying mechanism that mm -hmm. if their blood sugar is starting to become more controlled, that that could then produce an environment uh, or a state of their body, which would be more conducive to you know, getting pregnant. Yeah, that makes sense. That's what yeah. I was kind of leaning towards because everyone has been saying that it's probably just correlation. But when I was recovering from spinal surgery, I went through like a two year period where like I had no fertility at all, which like they told me to expect mm -hmm. um, just because your body's in like such a state of shock that yes. it's like once you get sawed in half, your body is not going to put a baby in you because like obviously you can't support that until your, your spine stabilizes. Yes. And so then like now I'm back to normal fertility wise, but there's definitely like certain things that can cause your body to be inhospitable for a while and mm -hmm. it might not be forever, you know? Yeah, physiologic stress, mm -hmm. which I'm guessing- Yeah, that's what, yeah. Told you, yeah. It, it has a very big impact mm -hmm. on the state of one's body. And so, but, but that's a proposed mechanism. Whether or not that's what's actually happening, mm -hmm. it would depend, right? So- it, it, I would just say those are personal anecdotes right now. Yeah. And it, it's not to take away from their experience. Mm -hmm. Inside these pharma companies, there's departments. That are focusing on these kinds of things, Yes, right? it's called pharmacovigilance. Mm. <laughs> so they're looking, for, yeah. they're looking for patterns of things that could potentially be useful for things like Ozempic. And I'm sure in the trials, you guys track that kind of stuff as well. They're required by the FDA to do something called a phase four study. So oh. what gets the approval is a phase three study. So right. phase four is after it's been approved on and the market. More audience, like greater use. Lots more people. Mm -hmm. And you, with more people, you'll be able to pick out more, more of patterns. potentially what's going on. Okay, yeah, because yeah, I saw some people speculating, like, I don't know how true this is, first of all. I'm, this might be misinformation. So maybe you can clear this up because I don't want to put medical misinformation out in the world. But I've, I saw some people talking about how when you're overweight, it can make it more difficult to get pregnant. And I saw a lot of people pushing back on that. So I am neutral in that stance. I don't know what is true as far as that goes. I think it depends on the degree of overweight. Okay. Um, because the uh, women do have a higher body fat percentage mm -hmm. compared to men on average. And the you know, if, if one has too low of body fat percentage, that's also a detriment. Right, that is also a detriment. Where right. it, I know you definitely can't get pregnant if a lot of women who struggle with EDs yes. also have fertility issues because right. of that. Yeah. yeah. And so people who have chronically high blood sugar that's uncontrolled, that could have an impact on whether or not their, uh, the, the chances of getting pregnant. It, right. Not to say it won't happen, but mm -hmm. it might be harder to it do it. It might be a limiting factor, yeah. Yes. So then as they're losing weight, that could also be a thing that's potentially affecting their yeah. fertility. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. On to steroids. Oh, because okay. Because we briefly <laughs> touched on those. And I really, this is like a burning question I've had for years and I just have never looked it up. And now I have you, <laughs> a human WebMD <laughs> so that I can ask. Why do steroids make you so old in the face? That's an interesting question. I don't think we know. And really? So, so but I, we, we have some hypotheses, but there's a lot of things like when you hear about aging research, mm -hmm. it's hard to quantify right. like how old somebody is. Like you, you might see online people will say like, oh, my you know, biologic age is 36 and I'm actually 58 or, yeah. or you know, something as an example. I, how do we quantify that? I know. I'm always skeptical of that because I'm like, right. you might look like 26 to me, but what if on the inside you're just like rotting? Right. And like, you just look great, you know? But like, did you like take their cells and then like start counting like the, like, the chromatin and like all this other stuff? 26-year-old like, cell, yeah. but he says he's 48. Right. Yeah. I'm, and, I, that makes sense to me. <laughs> and, yeah. Quantifying it, it was like, I, how would you do that? The other thing too is in the clinic, I mean- we don't have those measures. Like there isn't a good way. There yeah, there's no validated. metric for that, right? Yeah. yeah. Like there's no way to calculate it. Like there's no way that we could tell a patient. Like, like I mean, sometimes like you'll hear your doctor say like, you know, maybe to your dad or something to be like, uh, oh, you have the heart of a 50 year old and you're 80 years old or, yeah, or something. Yeah, but they don't mean it in like a literal sense. They're right. just like, your heart health is great. You know, yeah. like it's just like a way of, of right. saying like, you look great, you know? 
And so when it comes to steroids, I think there's a couple things, right? So the skin responds to hormones. Mm -hmm. And so it's possible that, that the androgens, like the testosterone and all that, when you increase that in the body, mm -hmm. it then changes the balance inside your body. Mm -hmm. And it could do something to the skin based on the fact that skin responds to those hormones. Got it. It looks thicker. I don't know if it actually is like thickening, but it always looks like yeah. thick. Yeah. Is it uh, thicker? I, I've heard people say it, it, it might be thinner in some cases oh, really? of, like, uh, of like gross abuse Interesting. Of, of steroids. The other hypothesis that I have mm -hmm. is that it's um, what I noticed when I was doing powerlifting and, and all of that stuff when I was in college is that the more protein I eat, mm -hmm. um, it, it actually changed the shape of my face. I have pictures of it. Really? How did it change? Did it make it more square? Did, like what happened? So it it actually like, so, so right now my cheeks are kind of like, it, I, it almost looks like I, in some cases viewing. like, yeah, right? The, the buckle uh, fat. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it inverts when I eat too much protein. It gets, and like it just, yeah. Bigger in the jowl area? Yeah. Like, like it'll start to be shaped like a pear. That's so interesting because, like, I know, like, dermatology-wise, because, like, I get acne scar treatments, this area is so hard to get thicker. Maybe right. I should start eating more protein. Maybe. Maybe that's what I need to do. <laughs> I'm going to try. I'll, I'll text you in a couple months. Okay. Like, do I look pear-shaped? <laughs> do I look, have you seen a change? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, okay, so we don't have an actual answer on it. I just know that, like, We've, we've got to eventually find one because I feel like all of like the fitness bros who like are like bright red. So like you can tell mm -hmm. that there's some sort of like assist happening. Yes. I guess is like the nicest way to, to put it like some performance enhancer. They always, they, they look so much aggressively older than when they start the fitness journey and they're not red yet. So it makes me think that like previously they probably weren't using any sort of steroids or I don't even know if like, does, does pre-workout have steroids in it? No, no, su so, supplements right? typically won't. Um, but what, what's interesting is the, the protein aspect, it, it, it really does go along with the, the steroid use because, you know, if you're using gear, yeah. right, you'll want to eat more, yeah. right? And so uh, th that part, there are some people who say, like, they know why protein ages you. But I don't know. I, I don't know You're if there's not a sure good, how legit it is. I, yeah, I mean, th there's some people that might report a couple studies, but like it, in terms of like medical treatment of mm -hmm. patients, like that's not something. Yeah, it hasn't at. been peer reviewed enough right. to like get any solid answer. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. With with like pre workout and stuff, I've never. Actually, that's not true. I almost lied on the pod. I took pre pre workout one time. Oh, okay. I like mixed it in with my coffee, and it made it all chunky. And Ooh. then I was grossed out, and so <laughs> I didn't drink it after that. But I know some people like swear by it. But uh -huh. I've also seen other people be like, "It's meth." So like, what what's up with pre workout? Is it like a spectrum? Does it depend on the brand? Is it good? Is it bad? What do you think? Pre workout, or at least from what I remember, like when I was in college, was that it was just it was kind of just becoming a thing. There was a precursor to it. I remember from like 2007 mm -hmm. of uh, something called Perry workout supplement. Perry workout. So there was a thing that, that we used to do and it never like, I, I, I hated it. It was called waxy maze. Waxy maze. Yeah. And, and you I ate it. I don't think people do it anymore. And so it was cornstarch. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it was uh, it was what they call high molecular weight carbohydrates. Okay. So the rationale for it was like you put this cornstarch in water, and then like as you're warming warming up on your yeah. squats, like you drink this cornstarch. It would always settle to the bottom. Yeah, and it gets gross at the bottom. Yeah, that's what happened to my coffee. Yeah, <laughs> it's really disgusting. It was it was almost like um like a clay. Ew, yeah. like a paste. I yeah. saw like a girl would take her pre-workout and get it like damp and mold it into like balls and eat it. Oh. And I was disturbed by that. Like, I don't know. And people were like, that's so bad for you. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know if it's worse for you than like drinking it, but it does look terrible to me. Like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it, it gets in your body the same that's way. That's what so I'm thinking, right? Like it's you're going to just digest. It's like when yeah. people are like, uh, mix their food together and they're like, it's all going to the same place. Yeah. Versus people who separate it and stuff. I feel like sphere or no, it's 
probably equally good or bad yeah. for you or neutral. As long as it's not like triple the dose. Yeah, yeah. well, cause, okay, yeah. Cause you talked about that TikToker that took like what, like eight, eight scoops. scoops a pre-workout and like, what's the standard? Like one, two? Yeah, it, usually one or yeah. I, I, you want to stay away from taking too much of it because there's a lot of stimulants in there. Yeah, because yeah. it hypes you up. Like it's got caffeine and stuff, right? Yeah, people will like they're start like, shaking like <laughs> during their set because they're so amped they're up. They're amped. Yeah. They're ready to go. But back to Ma Waxy Maze. Oh yeah, back to Waxy. We had, we'll get to our TikToker. Yes. Waxy Maze. Waxy Tell me Maze. about this disturbing. So you would drink it while you're warming up. Mm -hmm. and you drink it and the rationale is that it, it goes through your stomach real quick and then absorbs into your intestines and you'll get carbohydrates in floating around in your blood that will then supply your muscles with the carbs that you need. That sounds like a recipe for like power lifters to like shit themselves. Honestly, <laughs> like that's all I can think about. It, it didn't last for very long. I, I remember like there was a whole bunch of hype behind yeah. it and then people were like, this doesn't do anything. It didn't do anything. Yeah, and, and, It was just like a placebo. Yeah. Mm. It wasn't, uh, I, I didn't like it, but that was, to me, that was like a precursor to pre-workout. Pre I, I think obviously the idea of it was from a long time ago. Yeah. And even this Perry workout. So while you're working out, you're drinking this starch mix and then you have your shake afterwards and then you have your big meal yeah. and, and all of that. Within your 30 minute window so that everything works. So the 30 minute window is kind of a, a newer thing. Is it? Yeah. My boyfriend swears by the thirty minute food. I, I, I think is it accurate? It, I think it there's some there's some truth to it. Okay. Because the NFL rides for that thirty minute yeah. window. Yeah. Like they're serious about it. Yeah. I, I think it's okay. it's a it's a newer innovation, but it definitely has merit, uh, I think. It, now whether or not it actually works, it doesn't hurt to to just to make just sure that you it. eat well yeah. after you're done training. That makes sense. Right? For people who don't know, the thirty minute window is like after you work out, you're supposed to eat like a good balanced meal within thirty minutes to make your workout like count as as much as possible. Yeah. Um, that okay, cool. So now yeah. I have to keep doing because he's listening. He's <laughs> he's in the background over there, like, see, I told you, you got it. Because I always forget. Like I always want to just like go to sleep after I oh, yeah. exercise and he's like, you got to eat. Yeah. Yeah. You got to eat. And that was a, one of the first things that I, I remember uh, when I started doing the powerlifting mm -hmm. thing was for like two years, I wasn't making any progress. Cause you weren't eating enough. Yeah. Wasn't eating enough afterwards and I wasn't eating enough throughout the day. Yeah. I remember I went to the powerlifting gym uh, in Illinois and one of the coaches was like, well, first of all, like you need to be 275 pounds if you want to lift any weight. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> and you're like, oh, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, because your, your distance of moving is is more than a guy that's, uh, you know, a little bit smaller yeah. uh, in terms of weight and size. And so they were just like, yeah, you have to, you know, your, your, your range of motion is too much. So you got to beef it up. up. Yeah. And then that way, then the cross section of the area yeah. that the weight's sitting on is greater. Makes it a little more balanced. Got to do one of these, you know. But I, I couldn't bring myself to get to 275 to pounds it was it was hard yeah the, i feel i feel for the guys like the o-line guys who are like huge they have to eat so much every day and like some of those guys like i know they're like nauseous they're just like choking it down yeah and i don't think i could i don't think i have the willpower i have like a great respect for it because i'm like i don't know if i could be make myself eat that much yeah you know i i think in in the context of sports and athletics mm -hmm. it's harder to gain weight than it is to lose weight yeah per definitely because yeah. like you're you're moving so much that like the weight's probably just gonna fall off yeah. you know but those guys who have to like constantly like bulk up like the off season they lose a lot of weight and yes. then when they're getting back out there they got to eat like eight meals a day it's it's crazy actually like the facility like provides a lot of it but I don't, I don't know if I can ever like beat somebody. Like if I was like an actor or something and I had to gain like a ton of weight for a role, I think I, I would be able to do it, but I think I would, I would really struggle, you know? It's unpleasant. Yeah. Like, I, I, when I was doing, uh, I, I gained up to, I went from 160 to 242 and I would. It's a big difference. Yeah. That took me a second to process where I was like, <laughs> <laughs> good for you. That's hard. It was, it was awful doing it yeah. because I remember I had like a, you know, those frozen lasagnas, like family size. Mm -hmm. I would have one for dinner. And then like the next morning you wake up, you have like a dozen eggs. Oh. You have a gallon of milk before noon Thanks. and you have like a loaf of bread. It, it, you just, you felt disgusting. Yeah. And like you had to, you had to eat until you, until it was like on the way up. Yeah. And then you're like, 
and you right. do it four more times that day and oh like and it God. ended with that that two and a half pound family size lasagna That's and i was crazy. like crazy it was awful there's a lady on tiktok who like i don't know what she does i don't even think she does like powerlifting or anything like that but she she was like one of those like raw meat people have you oh, seen those yes. people where they they like love eating like steak and stuff i like a good steak tartare you know from time to time mm -hmm. Um, so like, I get it, but I, I don't know if I could eat like a tomahawk steak raw like that, you know, like, I don't know that that's me, but, um, yeah, she was like, recently I've been eating 12, uh, boiled eggs in the morning and then raw steak. And I was like, you have got to just have like the gnarliest, like movements of anyone. <laughs> like that's actually an insane choice. Yeah. She is living like a cave woman. I yeah. mean, I had like a weird respect for it, honestly, because I was like, I don't know if I could be you yeah. if I had to. I don't know if I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's like so much protein. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. And protein, the the thing that I noticed when I was eating too much is, uh, so your liver can only process so much, mm -hmm. like when you're eating like that. And the special thing about protein is the amino acids. So amino means it has nitrogen in it. Mm -hmm. And so when your liver processes anything that has nitrogen, it breaks it down to the most simple form, which is ammonia. <laughs> and so you start to sweat and it smells like ammonia. ammonia? And you use the Nasty. bathroom and it smells, it smells like, like ammonia. ammonia. Yeah. And so like excess, gross excess protein ends You're smell crazy. That. Yeah. Wow. I never yeah. knew that. So like when people talk about getting the meat sweats, it's a real thing. Yeah. It's, it's just ammonia sweats. <laughs> That's actually insane. Well, I don't know if it's ammonia, but but still though, yeah. it's a nasty sweat smell from yeah. eating too much protein. Yeah. That's actually that actually tracks. I'm thinking back on my life and I'm like, yeah, I feel like I know people who <laughs> <laughs> have like, the ammonia sweats. <laughs> okay, our TikToker though. So like Oh yeah. What I I didn't watch that video. I saw the thumbnail and I was like, I don't want it to be spoiled. Like I want him to tell oh, me about it. Can okay. you give a brief summary about that? Because I know yes. boomers love when kids on TikTok do crazy dumb things where they're just like, they're eating Tide Pods, they're going crazy, <laughs> they're dying their hair pink. What's going on? Yeah. So what what the heck happens if you eat that much pre workout? There's two things. So it was a guy who I guess tried to get clout on TikTok. Uh, by dry scooping, which had always existed, but it was yeah. really becoming a, a thing around that time. Okay, it was like so late 2020. Dry scooping, that kind of touches on like what we were talking about earlier with her eating it like a bowl or a ball. I, I see people talk about dry, dry scooping all the time, which is like where you just take the pre workout and you just put it in your mouth, like mm -hmm. cinnamon challenge style. Is yeah. it like more, it's more potent, right? Because it's not watered down or like what, does that have an extra danger to it or is it just gross and not really. flowery? It's a, it's a convenience measure in most cases. Okay. So like, uh, for example, when, when I took creatine in my powerlifting days, uh, you could mix it with like a whole gl glass of water mm -hmm. and then drink the glass of water, or you could just take the spoon and then just, and just go dump for it. it and then just take it like a pill. Okay. Okay. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't like do anything more messed up when it's dry. No. Okay. Yeah. That's a good, that's, I've always wondered about that because I see people do the videos and everyone in the comments is like, oh, oh yeah. the dry scoop. Crazy. I got a lot of comments saying that, oh, dry scooping's not bad. And I'm like, I didn't say it was bad, but taking eight scoops is bad. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. So continue with your story now that yeah. I have clarification on that. Yes. So uh, that was around that time that, you know, people were showing them dry scooping and, you know, taking whatever. So I, I think he ended up, he did take an excess amount. Mm-hmm of pre-workout. And the dangers of that were two main ingredients. Now, some of the others might have been a danger. We don't really know. But caffeine was the most immediate one. That and, makes sense. Yeah. And if each scoop has 200 milligrams of caffeine and you take eight, well- It has that much in one scoop? Uh, it, maybe. Or two scoops? M maybe. I, I, so it depends on which product. Uh, right. I, I think the products are different, but, but some of them might have like 200. I've seen some of the workout energy drinks, like the little shots have yeah. about that much. And that's a lot. Of there, was a, there was a new can of energy drink that I found at Walmart that has like 300 milligrams a can. And I was like, what? That's <laughs> insane. Why do you need that? Yeah. You and don't. The daily, the daily recommended limit is 400. So you're, wow. uh, you're like right there. Yeah. Uh, it'd be like two cans of of uh, monster yeah. or rock star or, or whatever, but yeah, so it was it was a a gross amount of caffeine, which would then explain his jitteriness and yeah. you know all of that because what happens is that around twelve hundred milligrams of caffeine is when 
majority of people are going to start to exhibit toxic effects. Oh. So 1,200 milligrams of caffeine is a lot. Yeah. I, it's like, you're, I've got to be like 20 Mountain Dews or something. Like it, it's, That's no, it, crazy. it's crazy. It, is it? So a, a Mountain Dew can might have like 60. It's still anything more than like four Mountain Dews is like insane yeah. to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it, it's, it was a, a gross excess and uh, 1,200 milligrams is where you'll start to really have like your heart will be skipping a beat. You'll be sweating. Yeah, you're you'll feeling be shaking. like a sense of like panic probably. Yeah. yeah like just like a, a shrouding sense of doom, like yeah. anxiety will start to show up. Uh, I, I believe that's why they say 400 milligrams as the daily limit. They take a third of that. Ugh, yeah. That and so sense. this particular patient took a lot of caffeine, but there was another compound in that particular pre-workout. It was called a betyl phenyl ethylamine. And the, the name is important because there's another compound called alpha methyl phenyl ethylamine. And when you abbreviate it, it becomes amphet amine. Yikes. And so that's where that's some where people, the meth stuff that's is where coming the meth from. comes from. Finally so, closure on yes, the meth. Yes. And so beta phenyl ethylamine, which was in this particular pre-workout product, uh, it does get broken down in the brain. Mm -hmm. But when you take a gross excess of it, the, uh, what we call the toxicokinetics, so the way that it passes through your body starts to change because oh. it doesn't get broken down by the regular mechanisms anymore because right. those mechanisms have been overwhelmed. Yeah, they're like, you're going to OD on this. we got to just... Right. And so what happened is this particular patient had a brain bleed. Oh my God. Yeah. And that was from a, what we call a hypertensive crisis. So his, it looked like the blood vessels in his brain had constricted to the point where the blood pressure was so high. Oh, man, so they just burst. Something, something gave way and they had to crack open part of his skull to relieve the pressure because yeah. the, the brain is enclosed inside the skull. Yeah. It's very, uh, it's very rigid space. And if it's expanding the brain, yeah. you're, it can then squeeze through the cracks in the skull if you don't do anything about it. It can squeeze through the cracks in your skull? Yes. Oh my goodness. Yeah. They call that a herniation. I, I've heard of a herniation. I just didn't know it went yeah. through your skull cracks. Yeah. It, would, it, it can ooze through the cracks or it can fold on itself inside the brain because wow. it's expanding. So there, there's like a lot of different kinds of herniations, but yeah. That's insane, actually. Yeah. I had benign intracranial hypertension one time and that was a truly abysmal experience. So like I can't even imagine what like a brain bleed from something like that would feel like. That would be insane. Yeah. And he, did he live? Uh, I th actually, I, I think so. I don't know. The case was given to me by a colleague at uh -huh. the Poison Center. They de-identified it. Yeah, of course. And so it was just, it, it was like a, a three-liner saying the outcome and then what they did when they were uh, When they're the treating. Yeah. Okay, so like he might have lived, but maybe not. That's just like the it, the treatment approach. Yeah. Wow. If that's, you got... Stop doing dumb stuff for clout, you know, like you can't, you can't, you talk a lot about taking recommended dosages and not like exceeding recommended, yes. recommended dosages. And like, this is a perfect cautionary tale of like, why not to do that? Right. I think sometimes like we were watching your video, my brother and I like earlier in the week about the man who got like an STD or STI of some sort. And he took the, was it weed killer? He like yeah. sprayed. Yeah. yeah, and he thought that it was working, which, like, I'm sure it never was. Um, like, but he thought it was killing the bacteria and that his skin would fall off and, like, replace the way it does for plants. Um, and, like, he kept spraying it. And he thought, like, even if it was effective, he thought that, like, spraying it longer and keeping it on would make it more effective. Mm -hmm. And I think people think that with a lot of stuff. Like, if you have a really bad headache, you take, like, way more ibuprofen, but really, like, that's don't do that with anything. That's not a, you should never go over cause it's not going to make it work like five times as much. It's going to start causing other problems. Right. Yeah. There was a thing that I did when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a, there's a Chinese herbal medicine that you can give in headaches that you it's, it's top. Is it tiger bomb? It's similar. Yeah. I love tiger bomb. Yeah. It, it's similar. And the thing is, uh, I found out on my own because it's mm -hmm. uh, camphor and menthol. So it gives you that, that real- That like, like minty. Yeah. yeah. And I found out if you put water on top of it, it burns it, it even It makes harder. it feel more minty. Yes. And you focus just on the minty feel. Yeah. And then you forget about the headache. Yeah. But when I did it, 
I started getting like burns on my on my forehead. Oh, because of the combination. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. And so like I came to that conclusion on my own. And yeah. so it's like the Well, you field tested patient. yourself, you know. Yes. It was foreshadowing for your future <laughs> career. You were like, let's take oh, this yeah. to the labs, <laughs> you know, it's working out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I used to, um, my dad used to do this thing. My dad was not abusive. I'm going to say that before, like, <laughs> I had to say it into the camera before people are like, wow. He used to do this thing where I'd be like, oh, dad, like, I hit my knuckle on the door frame and it hurts so bad. And it would, he would only do it when I was, like, whining about something that was, like, actually probably, like, fine, you know? And then he'd be like, well, how does your left knee feel? And I'd be like, it feels fine. And then he'd go, like... And I'd be like, ow, what the hell? And then I'd be like focused on that. And he'd be like, well, how's your knuckle feel? And I'd be like, I don't know. Why'd you hit me in the freaking knee? He's like, well, I fixed your problem. And he thought it was so funny. I'd be like, you just made another problem for me. You didn't really fix my problem at all. Good parenting, John. Um, but no, it, it actually did kind of help though. Cause it would, it would like kind of distract and like ease the tension. But that's basically what you're doing for your headaches, you know, topically. Yeah. Yeah, and the the idea of like trying to like keep the contact period, yeah, right? That was that was something that the patient was doing. Yeah. He put a diaper over. He put a diaper over to hold it on. That's what truly like, oh my god, that was what was driving me insane. There's so many topicals that when you like remove air, they get worse. You yeah. know, like they or they get way more intense. Yeah, like Nair, for example, if oh, you put like yeah. a bandage over Nair, like you're gonna get like a second, third degree burn. Like yes. you can't you can't isolate it on the skin. Yeah. So I accidentally. Did that to my face oh. one time, which was terrible. I put like a bandage over it because I was like, it'll help. It did not. It just made me get like an aggressive burn on my face. So like, don't do that, anyone. <laughs> but yeah, no, that diaper thing was making me think of that. And I was like, he's going to die. Yeah. And he did die, right? He did. He did die. Yep. And like, that was a truly horrifying story. So how do you get like all your stories? Like when you first started out, was it things that you had just directly experienced? And now you just get them sourced from colleagues and like, do you get them from the news and stuff? So what's interesting is the first one that I made uh, was at, out of frustration. So the, oh. the, the videos that I make now, uh, when I started doing YouTube, I wasn't sure if I wanted to make medical videos. Right. It was a kind of a, a way for me to just be like, oh, you know, hey, I, that's a cool thing that I made on my own. Uh, it took about two years and then I, I remember being kind of frustrated. I was ready to quit. YouTube. Oh. Yeah, it, it was it was kind of a long story. So I I remember uh, when I left Chicago mm -hmm. and I, I came to New York City, you know, I, I thought I was like, oh, I, I lived in downtown Chicago. I'm from the big city. You're like, I know what New York's going to be like yeah. basically the same thing. And then, then I come to Midtown Manhattan and I'm like, no, I'm from the like, middle of nowhere, apparently. This is like 12 <laughs> Chicago's. Yeah. You're like, this is crazy. <laughs> and so the, the, the grievance that I had was like academic medicine mm -hmm is, uh, you know, oh, oh, I can really, I can treat the hell out of this patient. And then, you know, at the end of the day, like, hey, you did good for them. But there was like, kind of just like nothing else that it, it was like, you, you know, you, you s just move on to the next patient. Yeah. You, you know, you don't get like updates. You don't like stay in contact. Right. And so when I went to a company, right, then I found out, oh, it's the same thing, right? You're mm -hmm. working on a giant project with, you know, 5,000 people around the world. It's not really yours, mm -hmm. you know, you could say like, hey, I worked on that, but that's about it. Yeah. So I started making the, the videos as kind of a way to be like, hey, like this is this just- This is my thing. Just me, you know? Yeah, you're like, and, I want to reap benefits from like my work and see yeah. direct reflection of how well I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was, um, I, I kind of toyed around with like, how do you tell a story? And like, mm -hmm. so I, I did a story of like a, a weight loss. Mm -hmm course that I did with a coach that I had worked with, I think 10 or 15 years prior. And then that started to not do well. And then like, it, it's been oh. two years at that point. And I was like, you know what? I, You're getting demoralized. Yeah. I was like, I, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I remember I was in Orlando at a medical conference and one of my colleagues at Johns Hopkins was giving a talk mm -hmm. about um, hormones mm -hmm. and holding on to water. And so he brought up this case of, of a woman who drank three gallons of water in two hours for a radio show contest. I remember that case. Yes. I was, I've been so afraid of that ever since. Yeah. She was trying to win a Wii for her kids, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. And so there was a couple things that he brought up. And I was like, well, in the hospital, we see this, uh, it's called hyponatremia. So mm -hmm. it's just the, it, it's even though it's named around sodium, it's usually not a problem of sodium, it's a problem of water. Yeah. So if you have too much water, you don't have enough concentrated salt sodium in your in blood. Sodium in your blood. Yeah. yeah. And so 
I, I remember thinking like I was driving from like DC up to Baltimore and just like, I was like, you know what? I could probably make a video of that case because you see it all the time yeah. in the hospital. And it usually because of either medicines or the IVs kind of messed up somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll just make that video. And then I remember I posted it on like a Monday and then I, I had to do work in Cleveland. And then by Friday when I was back, one of my colleagues who worked at the FDA at the time she like took a selfie with like a whole bunch of her colleagues and like they were all watching my video and they're like, oh. they're like, oh, you, your video popped up on our feed and like we were all watching it. This is awesome. And I was like, okay. That's so cute. <laughs> That's so nice of them. Yeah. And so like that was how I got started doing the videos. Yeah. And a lot of the the cases are like the, the diaper video and the herbicide that was published in literature. Mm -hmm. And so there was uh, uh, there's a really gruesome picture on on the actual publication of that one. Yeah, I believe I, it. I didn't see. I saw your um, your replay of the, with socks was a clever um, retelling of some oh, yeah. of those elements. Yes, <laughs> yes. YouTube friendly. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I put a disclaimer at the beginning, like if if you want to look it up, you can. Yeah. But just know that there's a very gruesome that is set about of to images. Be horrific. Yeah. Yeah, and it was. I, I yeah, look it up. <laughs> yeah, there, there were there were two actually. Uh, there was a second case that involved. A, there was another one with herbicide. Uh, yeah, so it involved a, a fetus. Ooh, so it was like a. I see. They were they were trying to do a back alley situation. Yeah. With well, herbicide? I I don't even know back alley. The the woman just didn't. Got it. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. Dang, that's very unfortunate. She had no idea that it was gonna. Wow, that's actually really tragic. Yeah, and so that that publication, yeah. So it's um, I have a a team of four people who help mm -hmm. me with the videos. Uh, I think three of them are in practice. There's mm -hmm. one working at a company. Um, so yeah, it's a whole bunch of us. We work together on these videos, and uh, we're getting more towards the patient advocacy part. So there's uh, awesome. recent videos where the the patient shows up. Oh, at the, at the end, end, if they make yeah. it. That's and, awesome. I love yeah. that. I have a question about your team as well. Yes. That my brother and I were talking about this morning, actually. Yeah. You're the white guy actor that you have in a lot of your videos. He yes. Was in your herbicide video. Yeah. I love that guy. He just texted me. Did he? I on my phone and, yep, I got a notification from him. Love that guy. He's, he he's looks one of my like best he friends. has so much fun in the videos. <laughs> like when he's like acting out these horrifying things, he's yeah. like doing the expressions. He looks like he oh, yeah. loves his job. He's a professional actor. Uh, he you can was, tell. He was trained in Los Angeles and he was there for 10 years. That's yep. awesome. And so does he get like a salary? Does he get like a... Yep. Yeah, I pay him per video. And then usually like I'll, I'll actually even ask him like, hey, what do you think about this case? And, you know, just get some input from him. That's and like so we're cute. working on uh, some other videos that he's going to be in uh, later this year. I am like a stan of him. Like I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love what he, how good he is in it. Like he makes like half the video for me. Your storytelling is great. But then like his acting in it, I'm like, this guy, this guy slaps. <laughs> what about the other actors? This is like a Craigslist. You use an, an agency. Like how do you get the smaller roles? It depends on where I'm filming. So in some cities, they use a website that mm -hmm. you can find actors. Uh, in other cities, it's by word of mouth. Oh. And then, yeah, some other cities, it's like you have to go on Facebook and then like go in these groups and then like, hey, I'm looking for this actor. And then like, there'll be like a bunch of responses. That's cool. And then you'll be like, yeah, that guy could play a doctor. I like that guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's like, you have the final say, right? Like you pick everybody. Um, yeah, there's a, a producer I work with um, and she, she helps with kind of figuring nice. out. She but, narrows. Yeah, well, she she also helps like bring me down to to earth a little bit. What do you mean? Because, you like, get a big head. <laughs> sometimes, like I, I have like the grand vision of, of something. Oh, where you're like, like going full Quentin Tarantino with it. <laughs> and you're like, I can see the shot. Let's wide pan. Yeah, get in. All right, and then we we zoom out, show the whole globe, spin around. That's you. Yeah, and I love that. She'll uh, she'll keep bring me down to earth and be like, look, you're you're primary objective is to communicate what happened to the person. You're like, I guess. It would be cool cinematography shot. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, with, with YouTube and stuff, um, d when when did you first like start like going crazy, like popping off on there? And were you immediately like, this is going to be me now? Or were you just like, I don't know what to do about this? It was, uh, it was that first medical video about mm -hmm. the three gallons of water in two hours. Cause I remember there was like a whole bunch of cases that I thought, well, well, okay, if we're here, we're doing this. Yeah. Um, but there was a precursor to those medical videos. It was a story of like 
tech. Like I, I remember mm. before I was about to quit YouTube, I was like, um, cause I had posted a video and I had lost like a thousand subscribers and I only had like 16,000 no, at the time. And so it hurt really bad. Yeah and, yeah. and at the time you could watch it on social blade and like the number was going down. You're like, this sucks. What did I do? I was sitting there and I'm just like, I, I just want to quit. Like I, I don't, I don't like, I don't want to spend any more time doing no. this. And so I remember sitting in, in the room and just thinking like this computer has made all the videos in the last two years, yeah. but I have footage of myself building it because I had built it seven years earlier. That's cool. And so I was like, well, how about this? It's like a last ditch effort, last video I'm ever gonna make. I'm gonna uh, do the story of, of me building this computer and how it did so much for me because I'm gonna get rid of the computer afterwards. And That's I, so poetic, actually. That's yeah. amazing. And, and that, that video started doing well. And I was like, well, this format might have something to it. And then that format ended up being the medical videos. Oh my God. And Wait, so that's that was so cute. That was how it started. It's but you and your computer's love story. <laughs> <laughs> I love that actually. I'm like making your computer a little person, like anthropomorphizing <laughs> your laptop. I'm like, your laptop knew that you shouldn't quit. It yeah, there was there, the second one was a laptop that I had gotten, uh, I think like 11 years earlier. And like I had kept it because like it came with me to the move to New York. And I was like, I kept this laptop and like so it still had like my old work files on it. And I was like, well, I'll tell the story about that one too. The Pisces then, in me is really coming out right now. <laughs> where I'm like, oh, your computer. <laughs> I love your computer. <laughs> I'm so, such a weirdo. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, no, it, 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 in a way, it, it basically saved uh, me from quitting YouTube. Which is great because you're and, absolutely killing it. Thanks. You're killing it on YouTube. And <laughs> you're, well, you're, you make educational content, which is like, first of all, very evergreen, but also really important because a lot of people don't know where to turn to for their information. And you're a very valid source for information because you have a background and you put a lot of work into these videos. You have a team helping you. You know, you're doing a lot of awesome stuff with your platform. Not everybody else can say the same. Thanks. It's having a very positive impact, I think. <laughs> and you saw a lot of cautionary tales. Like you were talking about like the ramen noodle mm. video, for example, mm -hmm. about the guy who had celiac and he didn't know he had celiac. Yes. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so there was a person who uh, fell on hard times. He bought a he bought a scam business mm -hmm. and uh, didn't have any money after that, and got really stressed and scared that he couldn't pay his loan back because he had gotten a loan to buy that business. So he made all these lifestyle cuts, and the biggest one was going to just ramen noodles because mm -hmm. that was the you know cheapest kind of food, lowest cost food that he could get, and while saving money. And so the more he ate, he started becoming delusional yeah. and started like saying things. And his wife was thinking like, what's going on with him? Yeah. Like, and it was like a slow decline mm -hmm. where it, it, and eventually she just didn't know who he had become. And so she was like, oh, I, I don't know what's going on. And then when they went uh, to the, to the checkup, they did a blood test and they found he had a vitamin deficiency. Mm -hmm. It was a B vitamin deficiency. And so uh, this wasn't in the video. There was an original cut of the video that, that I thought was uh, maybe a little too confusing. Okay. So he was told he had a B vitamin deficiency and he found on the shelf there was B1 and B6. And he said, well, you know, if there's a six versus a one. It's more B. Right. Yeah. It must be six times stronger. So I'm just going to take a bunch of B6. Oh, no. So he uh, overdid it on the B6. What's interesting is the um, the overdose of B6 and the deficiency of B6 look exactly the same. That's actually so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's the only one that's like that. Really? Yeah. And so, so he just happened to take like the worst one for this. Right. So, so the, he was taking it and then they were like, are you taking, you, like you're either not taking this at all or you're taking too much. Yeah. And so then he ended up going back and then he found B12 and he's like, oh, this must be two times stronger than oh six. So he started taking a bunch of B12. And then when uh, he came back, like he was already just delusional, it, yeah. like, just everything like uh, uh, anemic. So he was super tired and everything. And n at the time, nobody knew what was going on with him. Mm -hmm. It was like, <laughs> this could be anything. And so he mentioned that he was taking all this B12 and his wife even said like, it, it, it's kind of weird. Messing that, with him. Yeah, that he's saving money on these noodles, but then spending it all, all on, on B12. B12. Oh, like, that's true, actually. B12 is kind of low-key expensive, actually. Yeah. Especially if you get like Whole Foods V12, that's oh, yeah. like unnecessarily expensive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so when when they did the blood test, they found out actually he has no, B, like he's not absorbing any B12 at all. 
Really? It's like, wait, what? Like, if you're taking all this, like, what's going on here? Yeah, where's it going? And so if he wasn't absorbing anything, then they were like, well, how about this? Why don't we try a scope, right, to send a camera right. down his throat? And this is where your video picks back up. Yes. Yeah, okay. And then they find, like, oh, actually, his uh, his intestines are smooth. Yeah. Like, something's breaking everything apart on the inside, like, and what's going on here? So then they do the blood test, and they're like, oh, it's, this is celiac disease. What's he eating? He's only a, gluten? Only gluten. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and that makes sense. So then they found out, okay, well, there we go. It, it's almost never that easy to find celiac disease. Like there's people who will live with it for like 30-something yeah, years. Yeah, for so years. long. Yeah. I, I had a friend who had like severe celiac disease, and they found out because like she almost like died because of how severe her celiac was. I was so shocked to see that like his intestinal lining had gotten smooth like that, that it yep. broke off all of like those that fibrous tissue. Yep. I, is that what normally happens with celiac, or is that just because he was so far gone? Um. It, it manifests in different ways, but yeah, there's like different degrees of how much the immune system has destroyed that inner lining of the intestines. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. With with like eating stuff, <laughs> how many like things do people like commonly eat without realizing like how terrible it is for you? Uh, it depends. So I would say this kind of goes back to how we started the conversation. Mm -hmm is there's a, a lot of times that you'll hear on podcasts, they'll say like, oh, sugar is a drug. Yeah. Sugar is absolutely They're a like drug. Like you get addicted to it. Yeah. Right. And to me, that doesn't pass muster. The reason being... Mustard? No, muster. Mustard. Oh, mustard. Yeah. It, it, it <laughs> I was like, I love yeah. mustard. Like, like if, we, if we test the idea, it, it doesn't pass as a drug. And the reason okay. why is that your body turns what you eat into sugar. Oh, yeah. oh, that's a kind of a good point. And so drugs are defined as something that your body doesn't make yeah. on its own. So right? then it or, craves at it, least in one or way. at least it doesn't make anywhere near as much. Like it releases like a bunch of serotonin or whatever. Right. And okay. so, yeah, I, I think uh, sugar, like just straight sugar and how, you know, like, like when people lose weight on a diet, mm -hmm. they'll be very strict, but then they'll start to slowly loosen up mm -hmm. over time. And then sometimes they'll become so relaxed that, you know, they're eating like how they used to. Mm -hmm. And so that it does creep up on you. And, and like everyone goes through these periods of, of cycles when it comes to how strict and mm -hmm. how not strict. So I would say sugar is in a lot of things mm -hmm. and people might eat much more of it than, than, they realize. than they realize. And that can then become an issue. Now, the, the greater question would be, is that, something that's in our food, right? Is that getting built in and mm -hmm. causing the problems that we have, uh, the health problems? But, but yeah, over time, too much sugar can be a problem. But staying away from it, you can try to stay away from it, but your body it does, it's inevitably, keep making it. does inevitably make sugar from what you eat, whether it's proteins or fats. The granola moms are going to hate hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be like, we're a sugar-free household. And you're yeah. like, guess what? Impossible. Yeah. So the body does eventually make it. But, uh, you, you know, you can limit the insulin spikes mm -hmm. uh, going back to that. Yeah. And so uh, just eating pure sugar can spike the insulin. Uh, and if you're able to, you know, have complex carbohydrates rather than, you know, just have that sugar rush all the time, those are things that help. Okay. With, I have a question about like MSG because like yes. early 2000s, oh, yeah. big MSG scare. People were freaking out. I feel like everybody's moms when I was in like elementary school, middle school were like anti MSG. Yeah. In the last couple of years, I've seen a lot of people being like normalize MSG. It's fine. Yep. Is it fine? What's interesting is there was a paper that was written, I think it was sent to the New England Journal of Medicine. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was kind of a hoax. I, it, it, so, so they wrote about this Chinese restaurant syndrome. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, that's, that's what everyone would refer to it as. And I was like, right. this feels xenophobic. Yeah, is it? well, uh, I, I don't think it was intentionally trying to be like that. Okay. Um, it was just kind of, a, it was a, I wonder if, if the original, uh, premise of that person writing the letter to the New England Journal mm -hmm. was to see whether or not the journal would just accept whatever. Yeah. Right. Based on, oh, you're, you're from whatever institution, you have this backing on your name, like, well, you know, this this might be a thing, right? Yeah. I, I wonder if that was what the test was, but the MSG part of it, 
uh, was interesting because it's like, well, yeah, if you're taking a huge sodium load, like mm -hmm. you'll feel bloated, you know, you'll have a lot of water because that's what sodium does. The glutamate part of it is uh, it's also a neurotransmitter. So it's a chemical mm -hmm. in your brain. So when you eat food with MSG, it, it tastes better, if yeah, you will. Yeah, right? you get more umami. Yeah, yeah. and, and your, your brain perceives it as tasting better. Uh, whether or not it has those health effects could be maybe perpetuated by too much sodium. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, does the glutamate part do something, you know, negative to your brain? Probably not, um, at least in moderate amounts. So that part, yeah, yeah, there's these periodic health scares that come up, and they'll come up in waves, and, you know, people will be like really... Uh, you know, cautious of, of yeah. one thing. And like, uh, I think on TikTok recently, I saw something about Red 40. Oh my gosh, like, yes. <laughs> everybody's losing it. So <laughs> Red 40, is it fun? Everyone's freaking out about it. Um, in in regular amounts, mm -hmm. like normal amount, not like, you know, taking the, uh, you, you know, the, like those water flavoring, like liquid mm -hmm. water flavor. Like if, if you're drinking that, like gallons of it every day, that's probably an issue. Yeah. Right. And probably more than but Red like, 40 is going to get in you. In moderation, like every once in a while. Yeah. It's fine. Every, every yeah, I think probably in regular amounts it, it might be okay. I, I don't know if people like it might have an, an allergy to it. Oh yeah, that's probably uh, possible. Yeah, I'm sure there's some people who are allergic to Red Forty. I feel like I've heard of that. Yeah. And so th there was the meme of like Red Forty maxing, and like, <laughs> people would just joke about like, <laughs> what, what is it like something about becoming infertile because of oh because of all the red 40 yeah have okay speaking of maxing looks maxing oh yeah there's some dangerous stuff with looks maxing and one of the more severe things is bone smashing have you heard of this yes you've heard of yes. bone smashing yes <laughs> so for anyone who doesn't know it's like you take rocks and other sharp things some people use a gua sha and you just hit yourself in like the jaw and like the cheeks to try and like make them grow bigger it's the same like it's like a very shitty version of of how some plastic surgeries work, like a rhinoplasty, obviously your cartilage is broken and, and reset, but it's just people taking rocks and smashing their face slowly in the hopes that it'll eventually like reform rather than just fully breaking it and trying to reform the way like an expert would in a controlled environment. Yeah. What, what, what's up with all the looks matching stuff? Like that's the worst one I've heard of. But, like, do you know any others that are like dangerous? Uh, there's a lot. <laughs> well, there, actually, there is one other one that I know of that's like bad, where you like tie weights to your um, oh your yeah, thing. Yeah, that one's an old one though. There's like some traditional like cultures that have practiced things like that over yeah. time. Yeah, I think in Taiwan they uh, they drag cars. Like yeah. they'll, they'll tie. I've seen that. It's tie. kind of impressive, actually. You know, yeah. there's no way it's good for you, but also like, wow. The, there was a, a funny thing when when I was growing up because I grew up with Chinese parents, mm -hmm. and uh, it was. Um, what is it? If an ant can lift 500 times its body weight, then it's strong. Yeah. So therefore, if you eat ants, then you, you will, will be become strong. strong. And it was like kind of like like the logic. You are what and, you eat. Yeah. Kind and of and thing. it was like I I don't know how serious a lot of it was, but it was yeah. just kind of like a, it's like a proverb. Yeah. 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 That, I, that's kind of cute though. <laughs> there are some places like Brazil. There's this one restaurant. I don't know if you've seen Chef's Table. You should watch it. It's good. Okay. But there's this one guy. Like I think his name is Alex Atal, and he takes um, Brazilian ants from like the Amazon, and he puts them on some of his desserts because the ants taste exactly like lemongrass, and lemongrass isn't native to Brazil, mm -hmm. so he uses it as like a a literal like herb. Okay. But it's an ant. Interesting. And so, like, some places, like, ants are, are where it's at. So maybe your parents were right about the ants. Maybe. maybe. we should get an ants. <laughs> <laughs> well, we never ate ants, but it was kind of Well, was and that's like that why you can't lift, like, <laughs> 500 people. Like, you should have started early. Now, what, the looks maxers? Ants. Oh, yeah. Maybe, maybe we should start eating <laughs> ants. <laughs> they pointed this episode that's supposed to be about, like, being healthy. And they're like, and that's where I learned to eat ants. Yeah, they're, they're takeaways. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Oh, ants. He I'll, said eat ants. I'll Let's do it. I'll be so buff. Let's <laughs> eat ants. <laughs> Don't eat ants. Well, actually, you can. But it won't make you that strong. But it might taste like lemongrass. But um, speaking of, like, being super strong, you talk a lot about overexerting yourself, mm -hmm. overexercising. And before we started filming, I, I mentioned to you that you have a video that like scarred me for life during COVID. I was watching it about a, a guy in college, I believe, right? A football yes. player. Yes. He had gotten dumped. He was trying to like better himself, work through the, the breakup. And so he started hitting the gym super hard, which I think is a really relatable 
like thing a lot of people do where mm -hmm. they're like, whatever, she doesn't even matter. I'm going to get hot. I'm going to work on myself. I'm going to start reading. It's going to be cool. I'm going to do my gua sha. And like that can actually all be great. But, you know, within the realm of normalcy, he obviously took it too far. Can you give us a little summary on that story? Because that is like my deepest fear now. Yeah. What happened to him? Yeah, he uh, did this ultra intense workout of mm -hmm. like hundreds of reps of squat in like 20 minutes nonstop. Yeah, like 500, right? Yeah. yeah. And what happened was he had something called rhabdomyolysis. And what that is, is that the muscle uh, starts to dissolve and then it leaks the muscle proteins in the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And what happens is your kidneys will then catch these muscle proteins and uh, the muscle proteins will then basically just nuke your kidneys. Yeah. And so he had done significant muscle damage. I, I don't know what prompted him to like separate his brain from, from that kind of pain, I guess. I think he was just going through it that much, you know, yeah. like it might've been a situation, like a little email about it where it's like the pain fuels me. Yeah. Yeah. And so he had this, uh, this kidney, uh, it was impending kidney damage. Mm -hmm. But then what happened, I remember when he came through the emergency room was he had something called compartment syndrome. Right. So the, the muscles are like they're bundled together and they're, they're covered in these bundles. Mm -hmm. And the thing is when the muscle starts to die, the, it'll actually start to swell. But because it's covered by that membrane, it swells, but there's no room to go anywhere because it's covered by that membrane. What happens is this starts to compress the blood vessels going to the leg mm -hmm. and then starts to compress the nerves. And if you don't do anything about it, the leg is going to need to be amputated. Mm -hmm. So they sent him in to do surgery to relieve that pressure. They had to do like this deep cut, uh, you know, in his leg. And then it seemed like everything was okay, but this was a pretty traumatic health episode to him because mm -hmm. it really did shut down his kidneys. He wasn't making any urine. He had to be admitted into the hospital. Then something that happened, I remember him coming in to the emergency room about a year later and the diagnosis was different. Yeah. The diagnosis was that he had kidney cancer and that that kidney cancer had already spread all throughout his body. Oh my gosh. And that was only about a year afterwards. So the question was, did he do something in between that time? Mm -hmm. Or did he already start to have the, you know, parts of that kidney cancer start developing in his body mm -hmm. before he did the 500 reps of squat in 20 minutes? Yeah. So what was interesting is that that particular kidney cancer that he had was something called renal medullary carcinoma. Mm -hmm. And it's a kidney cancer that's associated with sickle cell. Mm -hmm. And so uh, sickle cell, there's, there's uh, predominantly, the, the, the common ones that we're thinking of, there's sickle cell disease and there's sickle cell trait. So um, in your body, you have two copies of a gene, one from your mom, one from your dad. Mm -hmm. And it, it also kind of helps uh, our bodies to become more robust, right? And so there's, uh, in the two copies, like, you know, when people have dark hair, there's a, they have a dark hair gene and then that dark hair gene's dominant versus the light hair gene. Which is recessive. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, sickle cell disease is both genes say you have the sickle gene for mm -hmm. your red blood cells. So, so sickle cell is the red blood cells become a sickle shape. Mm -hmm. Sickle cell disease is your blood cells will be sickle shaped all the time. Oh, okay. Then there's sickle cell trait. So you have the dominant regular non-mutated gene, and then you have the sickle gene. Mm -hmm. So in that case, the dominant one takes over and says, none of your cells are sickle, mm -hmm. except when your blood cells have to go through a really crazy environment, oh. either low oxygen, or it has a lot of salt, or, or just some, some kind of environment mm -hmm. where it's so extreme that something changes. Yeah. So one of those places that has that environment is the kidneys. Okay, so when he was overexerting himself, yes. it was putting him through this kind of extreme scenario where now he's getting these sickle-shaped cells. Yes, and so uh, in patients with sickle cell trait, mm -hmm. their blood cells are not sickle anywhere except in their kidneys. And then when you combine it with this extreme exercise, now it's everywhere. Now you're now you're predisposing it to really happen in the kidneys. <sighs> And so uh, I, I remember around the time that he came in through the emergency room, the NCAA mm -hmm. had put a statement out about athletes uh, getting really ill 
like, you, you know, when you're doing like two a days uh, mm -hmm. in football, uh, like in August, and it's like hot and humid, mm -hmm. and you know, you're pushing your athletes to the max, sometimes they might not feel well, mm -hmm. right, while they're playing. And the recommendation was just don't push it if they're, if they're known to have sickle cell. The more you push it, the more you might be predisposing them to a risk of this particular kidney cancer. Mm -hmm. And so that particular patient, I, I remember him very clearly because I remember him coming back the second time. Because when I heard the the 500 squat already, I was like, wow, yeah. that, that's that's so really extreme. something. Yeah. yeah. And then when he came back with the cancer, I was thinking, wow, this is really something remarkable. Yeah. Interestingly, I think maybe about six or seven years later, I was in Miami for a medical conference. Mm -hmm. And I walk in at like nine in the morning and there's somebody giving a talk about renal medullary carcinoma. Oh my God. And I walk in and I was like, wait a second. Like I, I remember this. And then I remembered, like, I remember the, this patient's face. And like, I, I wrote down the name of the person who was giving the talk because he was talking about how it develops in humans. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and he's like, this is my paper. This is my research. This is going to become my life's research. I've, I think I've elucidated a, a, a way that this develops in people because of the sickle cell. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote down the name and, uh, I remembered it, and then I, I asked one of my colleagues who lived in the same city uh, in Houston, and I said, uh, hey, Lauren, do you, do you know this person? And then he's like, one of my best friends. Oh, my gosh. And I was like, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, you want me to make an introduction? I was like, yeah, can you? At the time, like, I had just started making the medical video, so mm -hmm. I was like, I don't, know if I don't know if I know how to make a video that could do that patient justice. justice. Right? But your video did do him justice. And so, yeah, that video came out. stuck with me, like, almost <laughs> five years later. <laughs> Yeah, and it was. Uh, it took me three years, and then I was confident enough. And I said, "I'm like Lauren. Can you introduce me to to Pavlos?" Wow. And he's like, "Yeah, let, let's do it." So I remember I was in Houston for another conference, and I had texted uh, Pavlos, Doctor Masal, mm -hmm. and said, "Can we do a video on this renal medullary carcinoma?" He's like, "It's my life's passion." He's like, "This is what I study. Mm -hmm. This is what I publish." this is what I'm thinking about day in and day out. And I was like, okay, great. And so around that time, I had told him about this patient with extreme exercise. He said, funny you say that because I have a paper coming out about talking, talking that extreme exercise predisposes one potentially to renal medullary carcinoma if they have sickle cell. Wow, yeah. full circle. Yeah. Thank you so much for telling me all of your stories and stuff. You've been so great on this episode. Is there anything that you need to plug before you go? Um, take care of yourself and be well. That's all? Yes. He's so selfless. He doesn't need anything. He just yes. wants you guys to be I, healthy. I, I, I want people to just take everything in moderation. Uh, nothing super extreme. And uh, always listen to your body and just uh, do as much as you can to be as healthy as you can. Uh, I, don't go overboard trying to be healthy because then that can yeah. inevitably be unhealthy itself. Do everything within reason. Yes. Thank you so much. I really appreciate yes. you coming on. Yes. Thank you so much. You Thanks for having so me. Well. Thank you. Daisy, that's the name followed by the gale. I ain't never seen.